Well, welcome everyone formally to the Failure to Disrupt Book Club. We're so glad that you're all here. Um, we'd invite you to introduce yourself in the chat window. Um, tell us who you are and where you're from and uh, what kinds of things you do that are related to these topics. And I'm so thrilled to welcome Chris Gilliard and Audrey Waters. Audrey Waters is a long-term friend and colleague. Chris is a new friend and colleague. Um, and I'm excited that we can get together. We're going to spend the next um, 10 weeks uh, each Monday at 3 p.m. or on uh, a recording for those of you who can come uh, uh, who are sleeping right now, but, but want to be able to listen later. Um, talking about one chapter of the book at a time, um, we'll have a bunch of folks who come in to help us advance the conversation. Um, I'd encourage those of you who are listening synchronously to be active discussing things in the chat window as we're going along talking um, so that you all can interact as well. There, there are about 70 people online, so that's probably too many for all of us to turn on microphones and chat with each other that way, but hopefully we can have a, a great back channel going. Um, as, uh, as a number of you have found, we also have a set of forums that are associated with the book club, and those are at failure to disrupt.teachingsystemslab.org. Um, a number of you have introduced yourself, and I'm super glad and grateful that you've done so. And then a number of folks have also started um, discussing the, uh, the book and discussing the chapters in the book. Um, you can see some of the initial uh, um, conversations that are happening there at the prologue and introduction chapter page. Um, from what we can tell of the people who are coming, you represent all different kinds of backgrounds. Um, your faculty members in colleges, your K-12 teachers, your librarians, your technologists, your, you have a wide range of backgrounds. Um, and I'm excited uh, that we can all get together um, and talk about this book that I've been working on um, for the past five years and finally get to get to release as you all saw in the prologue. Um, it was written before the pandemic. Um, it was, uh, I was doing copy editing, you know, on March 23rd or something like that, right as, uh, right as schools were, were trying to shut down. And certainly one of, the, one of the steps that we did is we went through it and we said, is there anything that I've written in the last five years that I'm going to feel really stupid about having written now that, now that we're in the midst of a pandemic? And we actually went through and we didn't change anything. Um, so now there may be things that do in fact look stupid, but, but, as, but as far as you know, as I could tell, as the other people I asked to look through it, there was some sense of like, nope, this sort of is a book that at least makes a makes a fair effort at trying to explain how we got to where we got. Um, so I want to let Chris and Audrey uh, introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their work um, and then sort of turn it over to them to share a little bit about uh, what they read. But we'll just start by asking you, Chris and Audrey, not just to know who you are, but kind of like, what's your EdTech story? What's the, what's the interaction that you had with EdTech somewhere along your journey that sort of got you particularly engaged um, in, in addressing these issues? Chris, why don't, why don't we ask you to go first to introduce yourself and tell us your EdTech story? Sure. Uh, my name is Chris Gilliard. I teach at a community college, um, Macomb Community College outside of Detroit. Uh, I teach English and I do work in um, mainly interesting kind of privacy and surveillance stuff. Um, but uh, so my ed tech story, uh, I've told this several times, but um, I was, uh, I teach uh, first year writing and uh, my students or students were doing some work and they were working on um, what used to be called revenge porn and is now more often referred to as non-consensual intimate imagery. Um, but my college had um, heavily filtered internet and so when my students searched for search the term revenge porn um, the the filter acted as if they were looking for porn and returned either no results or results for like a tv show called revenge and things like that um, and that's kind of what started me down the road of um, thinking about how um, what it means when um, when institutions set uh, policy or, or set uh, educational or tech policy for one reason. And the reason they had done filtered the internet was because after our staff were apparently looking at porn. Um, but they said it for one reason, but it had all kinds of uh, fallout um, that negatively affected a, a student's ability to do work. And so that, um, 
it's a lot of reason uh, why I, I do what I do now, actually. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, what a great introduction to um, schools as complex systems and the unintended effects of, uh, of technology decisions in one part of an institution over towards another. Um, Audrey, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Audrey Waters. I write about um, education technology, both, I would say, the history, um, how we got here, and sort of the speculations about what the future is going to look like. Um, I am going to be participating throughout this book club, so I've got lots of ed tech stories, which is always challenging when people ask me sort of how did I get into ed tech, and it's sort of I have to sort of pick pick one that is most sort of most suitable for the topic at hand. So I'll choose, I'll choose this one today. Um, in the late 90s, I was a graduate student, um, also at the time teaching writing. And the university that I was a grad student at was very generously, I thought, gave us all uh, web, web spaces, our own domain, our own little tilde dot domain, <clears throat> tilde domain. And I could make my own website and, but I could also make websites for all of my courses. And I was really excited about this. I thought, well, isn't this great? Like if students, if students lose the syllabus, I can say, oh, it's online. Um, and somehow, somehow <laughs> when students lost the syllabus, they expected me still to print it out. But then um, in the, like I said, in the late nineties, the university decided that everyone should start using this new product that they'd purchased called Blackboard. And they strongly discouraged any of us from posting our syllabus and our course materials on our websites. They wanted it all inside the learning management system. And for me, I didn't really think much of it at the time. It just, um, I, I, I stew on it a lot now, but it really did strike me as a, a fascinating decision that the university had decided um, that we would know we were discouraged from sharing our teaching materials online and as a graduate student teaching for the first time It was really useful for me to be able to see what other people were doing in their classes And so I was I was kind of I was shocked I was shocked that the university would make a decision and that would discourage us from openly sharing our work and 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 thus and that's the from, the 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 <laughs> from Audrey's background there that's great they had they had no idea what they unleashed some <laughs> some middle level administrator or some committee there made some decision to you know they could have just left well enough alone they could have just said please put it in blackboard or wherever you want to wherever you want but they have no idea what they unlocked in that <laughs> moment that's great um well, uh, you know, I'm Justin Reich. I teach at MIT now. I used to be a world history teacher. And then uh, I started uh, a consultancy called Ed Tech Teacher with my colleague Tom DeCord. Um, and uh, um, yeah, sort of found myself in, in education technology that way. I will say that like as a young, like I definitely sort of came, I feel like I came of age with personal computers um, and my dad was not an engineer. He was uh, he was a like a doctor who did uh, drug development kinds of things. Um, but you know he like got us an Apple II Plus, and we subscribed to Basic Magazine, and would type out the computer programs um, from Basic Magazine into the computer. And in schools, I feel like the sort of the ed tech memory that strikes me most is. Uh, we had, I went to a Montessori school, which had a handful of computers that had uh, logo programmed on them um, or installed on them. And I used to write choose your own adventures. Like that was sort of my sweet spot was, uh, was recreating the choose your own adventure books that were popular. Um, and just in the last few years, I've really been thinking like, I think I was alone doing that. I think I spent a lot of time in that. Like, I don't think there were kids on either side of me. Um, and, uh, and that's been sort of striking me as well. Um, but uh, um, why don't we dive into it now? Um, so, you know, hopefully all, if you haven't, you're all, if anybody who didn't do the reading, you're forgiven. You all still pass the book club. Um, nobody can fail book club. Uh, yeah, the first rule of book club is nobody can fail book club. Um, but uh, um, Chris or Audrey, could you start us off telling us like, what did you read? You know, uh, you know I, I'm sort of gone now as the author. It's out here in the ether to be sort of reinterpreted in postmodern sorts of ways. Um, like from, from, from the start of this, what, what's the book about? What's it not about? What has it got and what is it missing? Um, I don't know, we started with Chris for the introduction. So Audrey, do you wanna, do you wanna kick us off here? 
Um, <clears throat> wow, that, um, I'll pick just a few of these, some of the things I think that, that really resonated with me. Um, one, one thing, having um, being in the middle of my own book was the prologue <clears throat> and this thought, which is something that I've been thinking about as well. And I think that probably everybody in the near education and education technology is too, is like all of these things that I think I know, they think I've done and written about ed tech what does it mean and what does it matter now that we're in this world in which we're all um we're all online because well not all of us are online most of us are online but we are compelled to sort of change the way in which we teach and learn because of the pandemic um and so actually reading the prologue my heart went out to you justin because that having to sort of rethink a book at that moment um, must have been daunting but really what fascinates me about the intro and about think about what you do throughout the book um, is I'm so interested in the ways in which some of these predictions from the charismatic people that you talk about, the way in which these predictions keep getting told, um, keep sort of failing to disrupt, right? And yet every time some of these folks reemerge, and they're often even the same people that reemerge we all sort of nod and um, act as though this is going to be something that changes education forever. And so one of the things I hope we can sort of maybe talk about is sort of what is it about the charismatic person in ed tech, but maybe what also is it about the, the, the tech side of ed tech that makes people really sort of um, really interested and really perhaps susceptible to some of these um some of these pretty ludicrous um ludicrous predictions so i think that that's just that's the piece that really interests interests me awesome how about you chris what, what what's uh, your starting point into it a couple things i mean i i'm interested in that as well because i'm uh you know there's um there are people out there right now making the claims, you know, I love in the book where you say, well, you know, um, this thing that they were saying was new has actually been around for millennia, you know, um, but there are people right now still doing the, making those claims um, as if they're new and they're kind of like media darlings. Um, and so I am kind of interested to, um, you know, tease out and I don't know if the, the book dives more into this, like why are we still telling the same story as if it's new? Um, I think that's really interesting. Um, I, but there's two other things. So one of, you know, as I mentioned, I'm like interested in um, privacy and surveillance. And I, one of the things you mentioned in the book is how um, school as an institution serves multiple functions. And like one of those functions is like to watch people, you know? Um, and I'm really interested in how that, uh, that function, which is not always uh, openly stated, but as like uh, ed tech, um, more and more kind of ed tech moves in from other industries, you know, whether that's prison or, um, you know, platforms or whatever, like that surveillance aspect gets um, magnified and more um, openly articulated. Chris, will you, will you say more about the a sentence that you said before, which I found very compelling because I don't think I've ever thought about it this way. A purpose of school is to watch people. Like, what do you, what do you mean by that? What are some examples of that? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, I mean, well, I mean, one, for one, the pandemic highlighted that, um, that it's a place where kids go because their parents have to go to work. You know, I mean, it's a place where kids get fed. It's a, you know, like all these things. Um, it's, you know, and I, I mean, as an educator, I don't want to overstate this, right? I, I mean, I believe strongly in education, but um, it is a place where um, people, in some ways, it's, it, it holds people until they are adults, you know? Um, and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to state that in the least offensive way possible. Um, and so, but I mean, watch, you know, in all the different ways you might think about it. I mean, um, watch as in oversee, watch as in take care of, you know, um, watch as in monitor, you know. Um, and so that is often, it's a, a function that's not, um, I, I think 
again, the pandemic has really highlighted the extent to which that is true. Um, but I also think that um, most people understood that to some extent or another, but a lot of ed tech and we could, it could be the LMS or it could be, you know, cameras in, in schools or whatever it is, like that surveillance function like is, has really um, blossomed, not the right word, but um, in the last- Blossomed in the way that like kudzu blossomed. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in like the last 10 and years. Poison mushrooms blossom too. Yeah. Um, I think that is it, I mean, I think that there's something about even sort of the analog school, the architecture, right? If we think about the architecture of, of the classroom, I mean, it is traditionally sort of designed in a way to have the teacher at the front of the class in a, you know, in a, in a particular physical spot in which she or, or he, but she, I think, you know, has sort of the purview of being able to see every Buddy. Um, but then also the ability to sort of walk up and down and monitor, like you said, monitor what students, what students are doing. And I think that, you know, I think that that is part of, I think someone said in the chat, like part of sort of the hidden, you know, the hidden curriculum. Um, but I do think that, you know, there is this dilemma where I think we've, we've, some folks sort of now see the surveillance doubling down on their surveillance and are pushing back on it and some are really demanding more of it right and so what like how dare like students must have their screens on we must be able to see the students now um, because technology you know students have the ability to turn it off um, and sort of these these sort of new ways in which we're actually um, further asking students to give up <clears throat> give up their autonomy um, under these under these scenarios so Chris, one of, the, one of the things that I often, I think, I think I like default intuition that I have when I analyze these things is to say something like, wow, that's great. So, so I should be more attentive as an educator, as a researcher to how watching, all the different roles of watching in schools. Um, and then my thought is like, well, okay, so there's probably some ways that watching makes technology worse or, or where, where technology makes watching worse. And there's probably some ways that technology makes watching better. Um, actually, my wife is teaching at MIT this semester and she's teaching a lab class in material science. Um, and normally when they do these uh, labs, like all the students sort of huddle around a machine and watch a machine do some operation and shoot data out. Um, and actually no one has a very good view of the machine. It's just the most convenient thing to do is to have everybody go up there. But this year, um, they've taken a video camera and put the video camera in front of the machine. And now everyone has the exact same excellent view of the machine. Um, I, had an, I have another colleague who teaches Photoshop. Uh, and she's saying, we're going to be logged into Zoom forever now in my courses because it is just way easier to have people share the screen sort of immediately. Like, like she's, even, she's using Zoom both with her students in person and remotely um, because now instead of like walking around to look at someone's machine and things like that, she can just put it on the screen for everyone to look at. Um, and then I think about all the terrible ways in which we're recording every activity that happens in schools and that seems dreadful. Um, and then I sort of in my mind start doing these like cost benefit, you know, risk reward analyses, sort of what's good, what's not so good. Um, I, and I just wonder if someone who comes at this through the lens of privacy and surveillance, like do, do you have the same, sort of like intuition towards risk and reward, cost and benefit, or like, or, you know, is it, is it, too, is it, you know, from your point of view, is it like too risky to think about reward? You know, like we should, like, we should, like, there, like, there are concerns here that just sort of automatically overweigh um, potential benefits. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is that we're stuck with um, technology invented by people who actually didn't think about those questions. Hmm. Um, so like the, the big example I'm working, you know, I like, uh, you know, uh, I'm using now is like the whole thread that went around, you know, Twitter and made it into a bunch of different magazines about zoom backgrounds and how often people with dark skin, their face is not picked up in a, when you use a virtual background. And, um, there's a, a I think he's an educational technologist who, um, posted a thread on this and he literally like posted his head, you know, and he's a, a 
uh, bald, um, I appears to be white guy, and he has a virtual background and it works fine. Um, and then his uh, his uh, a faculty member who was seeking his assistance is um, what appears to be a dark skinned black male, and so he like looks like the headless horseman. Like, so it's just like a body and no head, and um, so like. And Zoom, I mean, it's been, in, you know, um, so like the people, well, I'll, I'll shorten this to, to uh, the people who made Zoom didn't think about these things. Um, they didn't think about harassment. They didn't think about Zoom bombing. Like they didn't, you know, there's all these things they didn't. And so it's a difficult question to do risk reward because it um, forces that question onto the user when, um, those questions should have been asked and answered or addressed or at least, you know, sort of gamed out to some extent way before that. And now we're just kind of stuck using technology that wasn't invented for us or by or for the purpose in which people are using it. Or bias. I don't, Audrey, what, what's your response to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the interestingly, so this was Colin Mabland, I think he's at, um, TRU um, in, up in uh, British Columbia posted about help. Uh, of course, this is the anecdote that Chris, Chris relayed, and he posted it on Twitter. And interestingly, Twitter privileged each time Colin posted a screenshot, Twitter privileged Colin's half of the screenshot with him um, in it. And when confronted, Twitter was insistent that they had um, that they had thought about racial bias when they created the algorithm for cropping. But they sort of, but obviously something had gone as, gone awry. But then even farther back, it's sort of like, wh like where does where do these questions for algorithms for you know this sort of use of algorithms to do this work doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be have been have been analyzed either. And I think that, I mean, it comes back actually to some of the things I'm interested in this in this um, introduction. Justin is sort of like, what is it? Is there something about is it the culture? Is it about the disciplinary training that technologists have? Um, is it something about this idea of wanting to engineer society or engineer school that, that leads, I think, leads us to sort of end up with these technologies being built by people who haven't thought about these things? I mean, what is, you know, it, how, do, how do we get here with the folks with, with the sort of engineering crowd um, missing the boat so dramatically on on these questions that well, it's, I, you know, I th I think that's a, you know you're asking great questions about so Chris introduces us to this idea that the technologies that we use in education are often not designed by educators and therefore they don't even have a hope of having these considerations because Zoom was designed for people who were thinking about like board meetings and you know corporate meetings and things like that. And um, there wouldn't be any black people on the board, so yes. right. <laughs> yes, and, and you know, yeah, among, among, among groups of people, you know, that are, that are um, you know, disproportionately white and, uh, or, or disproportionately white and Asian men who are, who are doing the development of them. Um, and, uh, but, I, you know, I mean, it seems, it seems like the point you're pushing on is sort of like, why are, you know, a, a, why, why, why do these kinds of people get power? Why do, um, and then why does it become compelling to them to um, want to change things so dramatically? Like, why is that, uh, um, you know, why, why, why is the charismatic such a, such a compelling rhetorical argument you know why is it like why is it compelling to the you know the university heads or the k-12 school board to adopt these things why is it compelling to venture capitalists and philanthropists um i mean to me and i don't know what you all think of this one of the reasons is actually the one that my good colleague cheyenne they already just mentioned in the chat which is because technology has changed every other industry um that's something that I certainly felt like when I started my doctoral research in 2009, 2010, um, you know, I felt like, and I was studying so the use of social media in K-12 settings. I mean, an explicit framing of my research at that time was something like, this social media stuff seems to be dramatically changing journalism and dating. It's changed the meaning of the word friend. Um, it changed the meaning of the word like. Um, you know, it's probably somewhat reasonable for people to think that 
school, you know, education is just another sector like medicine or journalism or retail or law, um, except that it's not. Um, except that there's a bunch of features of education which make it not like every other sector and why it won't change in the same ways. Um, that has always been a compelling argument to me um, that we, you know, that it's, that it's just sort of like, I don't know, the kind of bad luck for society or just like a weird set of coincidences that um, it turns out that there's a bunch of parts of society that you can dramatically change, maybe dramatically improve, maybe dramatically worsen through technology, but education just like happens to be one which for a variety of reasons is more impenetrable um, to, to those forces. But I don't know if that argument sounds compelling or reasonable to you all. So I, I, so my thing is, I think that education has changed and I think that education technology has changed education, but it, I don't think it's changed it in this sort of sweeping way in which some of these charismatic people talk about it. I mean, we haven't, you know, we haven't yet, although, I mean, give them a chance, we haven't yet just sort of destroyed public education. And um, we haven't yet sort of outsourced and privatized all of our public institutions and the way in which some of these narratives talk about, you know, Clay, other, Clayton Christensen and Michael Horn's other prediction was that, um, maybe, maybe we won't blame Michael Horn for this one, Clayton Christensen's other prediction was that half of universities will be bankrupt in the next, um, I think, 15 years, which he made seven years ago. And, I mean, maybe they will be bankrupt, but maybe it will be because we've decided to dis, uh, divest from, from public education. I mean, I, I do think schools have, I do think education has, I do think education has changed. And I think it's changed in a lot of ways, but I don't know that it's changed in the ways in which necessarily engineers identify because they're looking, they're looking at certain technologies doing, having made certain kinds of changes in certain kinds of ways and tend not to think, see, the rich, the rich landscape um, and the ways in which things change through, you know, politics and sociology and things change through culture. Um, but I always think, you know, or the ways in which they've changed is more akin to sort of Larry Cuban and David Tye sort of like, well, they sort of, it's the tinkering thing. They've changed a little bit. But I think this, I think that education has changed. I just don't think that it's changed in the sort of big science fictiony way that some of these technologists like to predict. Well, that's why we're friends, Audrey. <laughs> if, any, if anybody hasn't heard of Larry Cuban, um, Larry Cuban is this brilliant uh, uh, tech historian. He's now a professor emeritus at Stanford. Um, he was a high school history teacher, and then he was a principal, and then he was a superintendent. He was actually the superintendent of Arlington, Virginia Public Schools at the time that my wife um, was an elementary school student there. And he wrote a, he's written many brilliant books, but one of them is Teachers and Machines, um, which details sort of the efforts to incorporate radio and film um, and early personal computers in schools. And I, I actually, I just sent Larry a copy of the book and I said, um, the press wouldn't let me call this Teachers and Machines too, um, but, uh, but I wish they had because, you know, I mean, certainly the aspiration is to have the book uh, sort of do that. Um, I don't know, did, did you have any thoughts on? on uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm really interested and I like how you, um, you call it kind of a tinkerer's guide, you know, and I, I think actually Audrey would probably be much better at talking about this than I am, but um, I think, uh, so let me, let me um, try to say this the right way. Um, the, the obsession with disrupting or like massive change is not that impetus doesn't come from like wanting things to be better. It comes from wanting to scale and make more money. And so like that, um, so the idea that um, education is gonna drastically change or even to kind of go back um, to talk about like this issue of scale, right? So, and, you know, like I often get the critique, right? When I talk about like proctoring systems, like remote proctoring systems, someone says, well, you know, like, isn't it the same if someone walks around the room while you're taking a test? Like, it's actually not, you know? Like, so that drive towards um, massive disruption and in, in scale, uh, I think is what is part of um, the reason that so many of these things are problematic. They are, um, yeah, they're driven by more by uh, like investors and by the notion of um, massive, like, education remains one of the places that has uh, less been, um, it's, it's still being looted in ways that many of our other institutions have already been emptied out. I'll just put it that way. There, that there's still space there. Um, yeah. and, 
this is uh, this is I'm, we're maybe jumping ahead to some of the other parts that we were thinking of doing during during the book club, sort of the stump the chump thing. But oh. this is one of the things I would oh. like to push back at you, <laughs> Justin, is this idea of scale. And I know like learning at scale is kind of your jam. But like for me, like that's the problem with like this word scale, right? Is that like is some is the scale mean something different than public education? Does scale mean something different than adequately coming up with the funding, public funding, taxpayer supported funding that supports access for everybody to, um, to, have an edu to have educational opportunities. Does scale mean something different than open, for example? And um, if not, why not? And if so, like what, is, like what, what does it mean to talk about learning at scale versus, for example, uh, public education. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I get, you know, I guess learning at scale for me is, um, there are lots of learning environments with many, many learners and few experts to guide them. Um, and, you know, some of the ones historically have been, you know, printed books and printed textbooks. Um, some of which have been integrated in a variety of ways into public education systems. Um, and some of them have been deliberately ways of creating new pathways into higher education, like the, or, or into education, like the Harvard classics. Um, you know, this sort of like library of books that uh, one of the Harvard presidents publishes in the early 20th century, which says like, yeah, you know, read these like 50 books. And this is like basically as good as um, a Harvard education is, and it will be free and accessible and so forth. Um, uh, you know, children's television as another mechanism, which is, you know, about serving many, many learners with few experts to guide them. Um, and, you know, the, the availability of the internet just creates lots of new pathways for these kinds of large scale learning environments to exist, which build on existing efforts, but are not exactly the same as sort of existing technologies, you know, the, 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 the proliferation of adaptive tutors, of massive open online courses, of peer learning communities, they seem to be, to be you know, things that are, that are not quite like books and television, that they have a different set of affordances. I, you know, I think it comes back to my kind of like somewhat pragmatic optimism that like, we could build these things and we could build terrible things with them, or we could build great things with them. Um, and it's going to matter a lot, you know, I think a point where we agree, it's going to matter a lot, like, what is the political economy in which we generate these things? You know, a political economy in which we have very robust support for public education, for public higher education, is one in which we're going to build technologies and people are going to be like, cool, this can slot in here. This is how we can prepare people extra for these things or stuff like that. Um, and then, uh, uh, um, you know, and then I think there are other, you know, there are other political economies, like including the one that we're in, particularly in higher education, you know, with kind of austerity and adjunctification, um, where as we shrink, um, as we shrink higher education, you know, we, we shrink like the value of what we can generate. Um, I mean, I will also say that like some of the artifact of being interested in learning at scale too um, is, you know, one of the things that I was interested in doing with the book, which I think like the vast majority of the public is not particularly interested in. It's so weird that it's still in there. Um, but I, you know, I just observed that there are like different communities of people that study things that try to operate at scale. You know, so I proposed these three genres of learning at scale that we're going to read about in the next few weeks. Um, you know, instructor guided things, algorithm guided things, and peer guided things. And I observed that like it tends to be different communities of people who build and study these things. Um, but I actually think they have a bunch of similar kinds of challenges and problems. And so part of what learning at scale is meant to do is to be like, oh, well, let's get people to, to come together and say like, oh, well, maybe there's some things about making more equitable technologies that folks in Scratch have figured out that might be useful for the people who are working at edX or Khan Academy or other kinds of things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes, and then sometimes I think like, that is a, like a weird piece of like scholarly politics to try to weave into your book, Justin, like most people are not going to find that helpful or interesting. Um, but you can... Uh, you can find bits of piece in there. I don't know, Audrey, does that help at all? Or Chris, do you have reactions to, to that as what learning at scale is? Go ahead, Audrey. I'm still trying to process it. So go ahead, Audrey. No, I mean, I think, I think that, I mean, I think you're right. I'm pushing at you 
purposefully, but I do think, I mean, I do think that it matters in some ways though, how much we let these narratives, again, like we're circling back on things again, but how much these sort of powerful narratives seem to seize, particularly imaginations of politicians and administrators, right? That, that there's something about these, tech, these techno fantasies that really resonate, that really resonate. I mean, I just remember the, you know, during the year of the MOOC, um, the ways in which um, people lost their minds, administrators um, lost their minds. I remember when they, you know, the Virginia uh, UVA fired its, uh, the- My the, alma mater. Yeah, the, the board fired the, the president because they thought that she wasn't moving quickly enough and all of the, you know, the David Brooks op-eds and, um, sort of saying like this is this is it this is the end everyone get on board you know this uh, higher ed will never be the same it's the end of college as we know it I think TechCrunch pronounced and it was very much part of this narrative that you could sort of see be be really crafted and repeated by by people who might have had a background in teaching um, teaching machines to think um, but didn't really necessarily have a background in teaching humans to learn, um, and so it was, you know, it's just well, so, so it's such a powerful, politically so powerful. So, so one, one way I might reinterpret your critique is something like, Justin, it was the charismatics who invented this at scale phrase. Why yeah. are you using so it? Why are you using it? <laughs> because, the, because the frame gives them a privileged higher ground. I, I, that's a great critique and one I hadn't thought of, and I hope that, that people will keep thinking about that too. Um, what, one question that uh, Kristen DeSerbo asked both in the chat and in, her, um, and, and in her post in the forums is first, so I propose that there are these three groups I actually build on this work by Morgan Ames, um, who's a wonderful anthropologist who just wrote this book called The Charisma Machine about the one laptop per child program. And I completely stole the term charismatics from her and she stole the term tinkerers from David Tyack and Larry Cuban and, and skeptics is widely spread. So I deserve no credit for any of these three terms, except perhaps to use them. But she asked this question, are skeptics and tinkerers and charismatics, are they trying to solve different problems? Are, like they, are they different stances towards the same problem? Or do, we, or do you think they have fundamentally different problems that they're trying to address? Um, I don't know, Chris, do you have a reaction to that? Oh, well, I might, I, I wanted to go back though, I'm sorry. <laughs> go back, go back, we'll come yeah. back later. So I, I, the, the one thing I wanted to interject is that like this, so all these narratives sort of about like how um, things have been disrupted and what that means, um, and, you know, it's very important to note who's telling that story, you know, um, and like, I'm not saying anything new, but like, so if we look at, you know, it's, it's easy to bash Facebook right now, right? But if we look at sort of like Zuckerberg's narrative of what Facebook is, and if we look at, um, you know, uh, what people in Myanmar think Facebook is, you know, or what white supremacists think Facebook is, you know, like, um, or, and we can, so Americans in particular, I think really enjoy this narrative. I mean, you can see it when these guys go testify before Congress, right? That they all kind of like, uh, everyone's just like falling all over themselves to, to talk about how great they are. But like, it's a, to me, um, well, it's actually not an open question to me. Like I know where I stand on this, but it's an open question about whether or not like um, Amazon or Facebook or um, Google or like whether or not like that the scale they've been able to achieve has actually made society better. Um, like I think it's obvious like I think that they have not. <laughs> like, but like so that like story about like what that means um, you know I think it's very important like how we um, how easily we adapt that or, or, or accept like I mean you know I mean Facebook was like you know he stole a bunch of data and people's pictures to rank women. Like, that's how it started, you know? And so like, but every other like layer on top of that um, about it's used to connect people or like it does those things, but it's also a massive, you know, engine for uh, white supremacy and misinformation. And so like, um, I, I always like, um, wanna like, like uh, inject suspicion into the, into that, overall equation um because i think it is a question about whether or not things are better because of of scale 
I definitely feel like Facebook is a great example of where the skeptics figured things out faster than me as a tinkerer did. And looking back, like the tinkering that I was doing with Facebook was probably a pretty dumb idea. I mean, there was definitely a period, I don't know, in like 2010, 2011, I think, I think like, a, you know, a stance that I often bring as a tinkerer is to be like, oh, come on, people are doing these things. Let's like check it out and see what could, could come of it. You know, and I think there, there was a moment in, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, when educators were like really down on Facebook and you could find a bunch of evidence of young people organizing on Facebook to do productive educational things. Um, like kids were forming Facebook groups, they were networking with each other. Sometimes they were doing class or other kinds of things like that. But a key feature of what they were doing is a lot of times they were like talking about their homework or helping each other or things like that or starting new groups. And so like the tinkerer stance to that is like, come on, there's like some risk and reward here, but like, look at the reward component of this. Here are young people sort of organizing in some meaningful way. Um, and I look back on my advocacy of those kinds of approaches now and think a lot more like, nah, the, total, the skeptics totally had one. Like I should have just like told everyone to get their kids to log off and and leave it alone because it was a bad idea <laughs> um, and uh you know that I, I mean to me that's like a that that is that is one part of my ed tech advocacy history um that i definitely don't feel uh particularly good about right now um audrey do you have any thoughts on this question of whether uh skeptics tinkers and charismatics have uh, have different problems that they're trying to solve or different stances on the same problem um i think I think that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, and I think about where, <clears throat> where, I, where I put myself, obviously, where, and where other put, people would put me. Um, I think it's, if you know my work, it's pretty clear, pretty clear well, what- people have referred to as a skeptic, Audrey. They, people have, people have suggested in the past that I might not be EdTech's um, biggest proponent. Um, but I think that in some ways I feel like it comes down to questions of, of power too. It's sort of like, I don't feel like, I don't feel like the world needs another charismatic um, person, you know, willing to do sort of a TED talk version of why we need to disrupt education with their latest gizmo or gadget. And in fact, I feel like there's so much power in the, in the technology sector, in the financial, in the finance, um, the way in which it moves politics, like Chris said, when these folks testify in front of um, in front of Congress, it's you know it's it's major headlines. These <clears throat> entrepreneurs become philanthropists, and philanthropy, in my opinion, is sort of a way to bypass democratic decision making, a particular around public education issues. So to me, it feels like it's incumbent upon me to push back as hard as I can, um, and I don't feel like I have to sort of solve like it's not about solving a problem per se. It's just about sort of how does one how does one sort of push back against the sort of vast political and economic power of the technology industry and so that i mean that's a different that's a different role that's yeah and i think you know and i, I, I think that's that's you know i i think in the frame of kristen's question um are they trying to solve different problems and the answer would be yeah you know one thing that i hear you proposing is something like um where power is centralized and small numbers of unelected people get to impose their vision on public education, that should just like be resisted because that is not a good thing in a democracy. Um, and technology is a vehicle in which powerful people can make those impositions um, without, you know, um, without negotiating democratic processes and sometimes while getting celebrated in the press and those kinds of things. Um, you know, and presumably if we give charismatics, you know, the, like the most charitable possible interpretation, like these are people who think that they have some kind of power to, um, that they want to use their power for good to solve problems that are, you know, limiting human development or other kinds of things. I mean, I think that would be an example of like solving different problems, you know, in which, you know, a, a person you know, coming at it from your perspective would say, no, 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 the first order problem is not, you know, that kids aren't, you know, learning to compute math problems fast enough. The first order problem is like, how do we decide what happens in public education? Um, and after that, we can figure out like whether or not, you know, we, we want the intelligent tutors to be in there or not. Um, yeah, I think Here, here's, yeah, a, here's a question. That, oh, go ahead, Chris. No, I was just gonna. I, I thought Kristen's question was was really um, important. I, but I the other I think 
part I would add is that um, I, I may, I think I read this in the in the chapter that um, at some point you described education as conservative. Um, as a conser and, small C conservative system. Yeah, yeah. That is uh -huh. resistant to change. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think that rightfully so, you know, I mean, I think in that, uh, that's where I think, um, so like, uh, I do think that those three groups are probably trying to um, solve different problems, but um, even the, the framework of whether something's a problem, right, and like how much it needs to be changed and at what pace, I think are like quite like um, that attitude um, is like very different, right? If you see education as a problem or something that needs to be disrupted, that's very different. But I'll, you know, also obviously there's like lives that are being disrupted. Like it's conservative small C for a reason, right? And that's because like large, like large scale changes or like quick changes, things like that, um, have all these ripple effects that like um, charismatics are, are often not equipped or interested in answering. Or, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, who gets hurt when, you know, who gets hurt when someone, to borrow Sebastian Thrun's phrase, has a lousy product? You know, it's a, it can be pretty significant. But the experiment that Udacity ran at um, San Diego State, uh, no, it wasn't San Diego State, it was uh, UC San, San Jose State. 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 Um, yeah, I mean, people get, you know, people get hurt when, when, we, when we screw things up, when we, um, in education. And so I think the stakes, the stakes are pretty high. Um, so the sort of sweeping, sort of sweeping aside um, sort of gestures that they make, I think they do often forget that the, the, the educators and the, the educational institutions, again, have responsibilities in, um, that are, I think, a different, it's a different set of responsibilities than, say, you know, the pizza restaurant has to its customers or you know, or, or it's a, I think it's a different, it's a different responsibility than doctors have to their patients. We've got two minutes left, um, actually, because like there are a few MIT students in the class and uh, by contract, uh, an hour long period can only take up 50 minutes. So I, I only get three to 350 and then I have to let them go. Um, here's another thing that I've been thinking about, a sort of in, maybe an implicit critique in some of our discussion. Um, so one, one question you ask auditors, like, like, why does this cycle keep happening? where charismatics propose disruptive change, the arguments are found compelling, they don't work out as people hope, um, and here we are like back again, proposing them again. Like another person in that cycle is someone who raises their hand and says like, hey, we can look at the history of past cycles to make better judgments about what happens in the future. Like we can, we can analyze these charismatic arguments and see how likely they are. Um, it, you know, in fact, it might be possible to neutralize the power of the charismatic argument altogether with sufficient empirical analysis of history. Um, like, is that person an egghead um, who just should be like shuffled off the stage, or is or is that or is that a viable uh, approach to you know addressing these sort of boom and bust cycles in education? I don't know how viable it is. But I do think that one of the things I think that David Tayek said is that even when people are utterly ignorant of history, and let's just include, say, tech CEOs in that, um, in that description, I think that they still have an idea of history, right? And so even if someone has never read a book on the history of education, doesn't know who Larry Cuban is, has no idea when technology first appeared in the classroom, thinks that maybe it was when they invented their little app, um, that they still do carry with them powerful ideas about what the past was like. And I think it's incumbent upon us to, um, to, to talk about the ways in which the past was like, what, what the past was like, because it, we're, still, we're still burdened with that. We still carry that forward. So I do think that history matters because we're stuck with it, even if people are ignorant of it. What do you think, Chris? The last yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, um, to, to use a current example, so that social dilemma, um, documentaries on Netflix and like uh, one of the guys is getting roasted because he said well nobody said you know nobody there was no uproar when bicycles were invented when actually there was I mean like and so like they're, they're like the notion like because we all went to school like people feel like they know the history of school you know um and that that but that lack of um perspective that lack of history I think is super dangerous and again like in in in, in you know, whatever you want to call it, institution, um, 
how what how you want to name schools um it's more dangerous i think in a in a place like um schools than it is in, in many other institutions well chris gilliard and audrey waters this has been a fascinating conversation a great way to uh, to kick off the book series to those of you who are here um there's a bunch of questions that are in the chat and a bunch of questions that are in the discussion forums and i'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them um but keep the conversation going in the forums failure to disrupt uh, dot teaching systems lab dot org. Uh, next week we'll have uh, George Siemens and Liz Loesch, uh, two folks who are very much involved in the year of the MOOC, um, thinking and interacting and talking with us. Audrey will keep coming back. Um, Chris, I hope you'll keep hopping in as you have time in the weeks ahead. Um, but really wonderful to be able to get to spend this 50 minutes with you all. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, if you live overseas and you don't have a copy of the book yet, um, shoot me an email, uh, which I typed in the chat, and then uh, I'm more than happy to send you a PDF. And Chris and Audrey, once again, thanks for joining me this week. This was a really rich conversation. Thanks so much for inviting me.